Hi, library friends. Thanks for visiting. I hope you enjoy these stories today. These are longer stories and I'm still thinking about spring. So if you're a kindergartner or first or second grader and you like to listen to longer stories, this might be the story time for you. So let's get started. So the first picture book still that I have to share today is called North Country Spring by Reeve Lindbergh with paintings by Liz Siverston. And this is an older book and it's about that sound, that buzz of spring coming. This is a Houghton Mifflin uh, Company book. All over the North, a new voice is heard, deep as the river and high as a bird. Fresh as the meadow and strong as a tree, it calls over and over, come, listen to me. Come out, calls the voice, wherever you are. Come out with the dawn and the morning star. Come out in the sun as it melts the snows. Come out with the brook as it overflows. Spread out its sings to the trees. Be first, fill with sweet sap till your leaf buds burst. Take wing, wild geese, calls the voice. Fly high, soar a hundred miles through an April sky. I heard geese this morning flying over. Amble out, sniff the air, it says next to the bear. Let your brown cubs tumble everywhere. Step out, do not fear, calls the voice to the deer. Come and nibble the new green grasses here. Wiggle out, swim about, says the voice to the trout. Skim the silvery riverbanks in and out. Leap in, little peepers, to the pond and bring your frog pond heartthrob tune to sing. Glide down, wild duck, to the marsh and rest. Hide a clutch of eggs in a wetland nest. Strut out, tall moose, from your stand of spruce. Walk around, feel the ground, let your bones get loose. I have a friend who saw a moose on their front yard yesterday, so they really are waking up. Slip in, sleek otters, from the river's side. Splash and play all day, make a big mud slide. Come out in the daytime, come out in the night. Come out with the new moon, silent and bright. Fly out, blinking owl, says the voice, fly free. Float over the shadowy woods with me. Skitter out, little mice, but take care, be wise. The dark has more than a thousand eyes. Swoop out, swift bat, flutter fast, flitter flit. Snatch a moth on the wing, make a meal of it. Shuffle out, slow skunk, snuffle here, snuffle there. Grub for bugs and slugs, food is everywhere. Lope out, wild wolves, come out and prowl. It's a fine, shiny night for a yip and a howl. Come out, calls the voice, whoever you are. Come out in the dark with the dancing stars. Come children, come parents, come grandparents too. Come out, hear the voice that is calling to you.
I am the breeze that is warming the land, the fast flowing river that washes your hand, the green grass at your feet, the white clouds flying high, the seeds in the ground and the wings in the sky. I am the ducklings that hatch in the nest, the rain in the forest, the wind from the west, the violets in meadows when snow is all gone, the bear cub, the fox kit, the white spotted fawn. I am the voice inside every new thing, the song of beginnings, the song of spring. Uh, North Country Spring by Reeve Lindbergh with paintings by Liv Siverton. I like those. They're, um, I don't know what to call them. They're not very detailed, but you can still see. Really nice book. Spring is coming. So my friend who saw the moose, I heard the geese overhead this morning. I have a couple of tulips and crocuses. I don't know what you have at your house, but it's coming. Spring is coming. I'm going to slide over so you can read over my shoulder here. This is a different kind of story. Um, it's a Greek myth, and it talks a little bit about why or what the gods were doing to make spring come. It's called Persephone. Persephone, kind of a shine there. Retold and illustrated by Warwick Hutton. Persephone. Can you see that? How's that for? I hold that that way. Can you see? Yeah, I think so. Persephone. The tale of Persephone is also the story of summer and winter and how they came about. At the beginning of time, Zeus, chief of all the gods, ruled over the earth and the heavens. Poseidon was the god of the sea and oceans, and Hades was the god of the underworld. There's Zeus, there's Poseidon, and there's Hades on the bottom. It was dark and barren in the underworld. Only a few shafts of light filter down from the world above. There were no flowers and no birds sang. Hades could not persuade any nymph or goddess to marry him, for no one wanted to live in the dark and endless winter that was his home. In his loneliness, the king of the underworld took to wandering the earth in his black-horsed chariot, looking for a queen to share his kingdom. One day, when the sky was blue and flowers covered the fields of Sicily, the god of the underworld paused in his search. He got out of his chariot and looked around. Through the trees, he saw a wonderful sight. In the middle of a group of nymphs, holding the flowers she had gathered, was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. It was Persephone, daughter of the goddess Demeter. He would not ask her to marry him, Hades thought, for someone who loved flowers so much would not willingly be queen of the underworld. He walked quickly over to the group of nymphs, and lifting up Persephone, he carried her back to his chariot. Astonished and frightened, she was too surprised to protest. The nymphs ran off, and Hades drove away at great speed, Persephone's flowers lay scattered on the ground. He stole her. Hades knew the beautiful wife he had found for himself was Demeter's daughter. And he knew Demeter, and he knew Demeter would be furious when she found out what had happened to Persephone. So Hades drove as fast as he could to the underworld. He knew what he did was wrong. Soon he reached the river Siane. The spirits of the river, seeing such a beautiful girl being kidnapped, rose up in anger. A large wave, like a wall of water, threatened the dark chariot. 
but Hades had the power granted only to gods. With a flourish of his hand, he turned and struck open the earth as if it were made of soft cheese. There was a great clap of thunder, and Hades, with his stolen bride, vanished downward into the underworld. See that crack in the earth? That's where he made the big slice. That's his escape route. That evening, Persephone's mother began to look for her. All night, Demeter called, and all the next day, she was the goddess of all growing things, and as despair welled up in her, she forgot her daily duties. No showers of rain came, no morning dew, the land grew parched, and the corn in the fields was dry and shriveled. Meanwhile, below the earth, Persephone pined. She was sad. In silence, she sat by Hades' side. With the world of the sun and sky, trees and flowers gone, she felt as if she were dead herself. Hades admired his prize, pleading with her to eat something, but she sat motionless. With tears running down her face, thinking of her lost world above, Come and see my garden, said Hades, trying desperately to please her. He led her to a group of pomegranate bushes that grew forlornly in the underworld. Absent-mindedly, Persephone fingered the pomegranates, and as she thought of her mother, she wept again. There are the pomegranate bushes, Persephone and Hades. Hades is going to play a terrible trick on Persephone. For nine days, Demeter wandered the land above, calling for her daughter. Like Persephone, she could not eat, and like Persephone, she grew thin. Oh, she's so sad. Where is her daughter? On the tenth day, Demeter came to the river Syene. Here, the land was still green. The waters rippled and murmured, and as she walked along its bank, Demeter came to a spring that bubbled out of the rocks into the river. Something magical is going to happen. She sat thoughtfully beside it, and its soft crystal, crystal murmuring seemed to talk to her. It was the spirit of the river speaking. Demeter learned how the river had tried to stop Hades with a great wave of water, and then the bubbling spring told her of the river's long journey to the sea and how, when the river ran underground, it had seen Persephone wading and weeping in the darkness. I like this illustration. It's very, makes you really think about how far down they are underground. At last, Demeter knew what had happened. Furious, she went to Zeus, chief of all the gods. He had known about Persephone, but he had done nothing. Then, as he had watched Demeter grieve and neglect all the plants and crops, he had begun to worry. Zeus, chief of all gods, disliked interfering with the other gods, but he knew that this time he had to do something. He summoned Hermes, messenger of the gods. Hermes, said Zeus, I want you to go to the underworld and tell Hades I know he has kidnapped Persephone and that if she has eaten nothing while she has been held there, she must be returned to her mother. There goes Hermes with his winged feet. The eyes of Hades narrowed thoughtfully when he heard this message. Hmm. For the reunion of mother and daughter, Zeus himself appeared. But as Persephone ran into the arms of her mother, Hades looked craftily at her. Hmm. My dear Persephone, did I not see you eat some seeds from my pomegranates? Remember, that was the deal Zeus said. If you haven't eaten anything, Persephone remembered. 
Without thinking as she had wandered sadly among the bushes in the underworld garden, she had eaten a few pink seeds from one of the ripe pomegranates. But, but I only ate six small seeds, she cried. Zeus, chief of all gods, thought long and hard when he heard this. Hades smiled to himself at his trick. At last, Zeus looked up. He had made a decision. I have decided what to do. Persephone, you can return to your mother now, but because you ate six pomegranate seeds, you must go back to Hades in the underworld for six months of every year. And that is the way it has been to this day. Spring comes every year as Persephone rushes back into the arms of her mother to meet her, and the world grows green again. There's that. As fall approaches and Persephone must return to the underworld, the earth becomes sadder and colder. In winter, nothing grows, for Persephone is then queen of the underworld. There it is, the underworld, the end. Persephone by Warwick Hutton. It's an older story. Kind of interesting, though, how stories of gods and goddesses explain big things that happen, like spring coming and winter coming. They didn't really have any other explanations, so that worked for them just right. We have, I don't know if you can see my books up here. I have a lot of Greek myth books. They're very interesting. All right. Here's another one, a big, long picture book called Sugarbush Spring. Sugarbush Spring by Marsha wilson Chaw and illustrated by Jim Daly. And this is kind of an old-fashioned story, but so beautiful. I hope you like it. In the month of the maple sugar moon... The snow is too wet for angel making. Icicles rain from grandpa's porch roof and something is stirring in the woods. It's sugarbush spring. Grandpa hitches Rosie and Jack to the cutter. My fingers peek out of my jacket. No mittens today. And Rosie nuzzled my, nuzzles my hand for a treat. Maple candy tomorrow, I promise her. She stomps and twitches and jingles her harness bells. I wave to Grandpa, and he pulls me up next to him. I have to get this out here. There. This year you come with me, he says, and then hands me the reins. Rosie and Jack know the way. I bounce the reins on their rumps as lightly as Grandpa would. Sugar time, Rosie. He up, Jack, he calls. Into the woods we slide, under branches that hold up the sky. A crow puffs out his satin chest. Caw, caw, caw. The sun blinks on tree-striped snow. Where's the sugar, Grandpa? Inside the trees, he says, feeding them, helping them grow. The tree gives us their extra. There they go, into the woods for sugaring. I find two holes in a maple one on each side, like front and back belly buttons. Last year's taps, Grandpa tells me. We'll open new ones this year. Tap, 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 there's one. Tap, 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 then the other. I hang a pail beneath each of them and wait. The sun side spills first. Ping, 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 dripple, drip, drip, drip. She's running, Grandpa, I shout. Grandpa fills half a jelly jar with sap. Spring tonic, he says, and then sips and passes the jar to me. I squint my eyes into microscopes. No bugs, no specks, ice clear. Mmm, drinking sap right out of the tree. Tree juice. Let's tap this one, I shall, and try to reach around a trunk as wide as Rosie. Too old, says Grandpa. See all the taps? She's given and given till she's nearly given out. Hmm, how about this 
this one, I ask, wrapping my hands around another tree. Too young, says Grandpa. She needs all the sugar that she makes this year. She'll be ready when, this, when she fills up your arms. All around the sugar bush, I measure who's ready, filling up my arms with trees. We drill and tap and hang pail after pail until my feet are freezing and the drip, drip, dripple of a hundred trees has stopped. Grandpa, the trees are empty, I shout. Grandpa laughs. Oh, they're just too cold, he tells me. We'll have a freeze tonight. They'll rest up and run hard again tomorrow. Time to head back. He up, Rosie. Home, Jack, I call. And we slip through the purple woods under the maple sugar moon. When I wake up the next morning, frost is melting on my window. I know that the trees are busy. The temperature is rising. The sap is running. The buckets are filling. And neighbors and friends have come to cook. Grandpa gives us jobs. Mama and Dad drive Rosie and Jack through the sugar bush to gather the sap from our buckets. Donna Mae washes last year's syrup bottles. I polish them sparkly. And Grandma makes chicken and dumplings to feed our hungry crew. Molly and Ryan and I haul firewood into the sugar house. Daniel has built a monster fire to boil the sap. Jim will cook it down into thick syrup rivers. The sugar house puffs out wet clouds as soft as fog. Ben and Ian leap through them and disappear. You're it, Ryan tags Molly. Over here, I shout. Molly chases me in and out of the maple steam. Bathtub warm, cotton candy sweet. Already the sugar house smells like pancakes. Is it syrup yet? I ask Jim. Too soon, he says, and taps the thermometer. Should be 219 degrees, seven degrees to go. I keep my eye on that thermometer. 215, 216. The bubbles creep higher, swelling to the top of the pan. There she blows, I yell. Jim flicks in a drop of cream and the sap settles right back down, dark and gleaming. A watched pot never boils over, he tells me. The silver needle jumps, 218 degrees. The sap boils into fine golden bubbles, 219. Jim pours a caramel bubble from his long tin scoop. We've got syrup, he shouts. Grandpa draws off the syrup, the first two gallons, and filters it clean. Ooh, too hot to taste yet, but it's just right for sugar on snow, he tells us. He drizzles the steaming syrup right on the snow, where it instantly hardens, and then trails it in ribbons for us to pull and stretch and share with Rosie. Jack wax, Grandpa calls it. Around the cook fire, we eat dumplings, roast marshmallows, and tell stories while the cold sap flows into the pans, heats through and thickens and boils. We stir and dip and skim till we draw off more than three gallons. But we're not done yet. 200 more gallons of sap to cook before bed, Grandpa says. We toast our toes and take naps in chairs, in laps, or on dogs. Daisy doesn't mind. We popcorn and play checkers and parcheesi way past our bedtimes until we've cooked the day's last batch. Ten gallons in all. Everybody helps. Grandma and Grandpa fill the bottles with syrup hot gold in gallons and quarts and pints. We seal them tight and lay each bottle on its side to cool. At last, ah, we are done for the day.
Grandpa sets the first bottle in place on the windowsill next to the first bottle of last year's syrup and the first bottle of each year before that. Bottles colored like fall leaves, yellow and honey and bronze. A fine light amber, fancy gray, Grandpa de declares of this year's batch. There's room in the pantry for plenty more, enough for a whole year of pancakes, maple cream, and candy, and then still some to sell. Enough till next year, when the woods stir, and Grandpa and I again fill our arms with trees. Hmm, the end. So this story was written in the year 2000, but I think based on the pictures, I'm gonna say because they're sugaring with horses and they have to hang buckets instead of having tubing through the woods, that it's probably around the 40s or 50s. Although in Vermont, it may be the 50s or 60s. Take a look at that stove. Just interesting, an old fashioned story about maple sugaring. I hope you've had a chance to go out to the sugar house, although maybe not with everything that's going on, but uh, at least you can have pancakes at home, right? I'm so glad you joined us for longer stories today. As I said, I'm gonna be offering some more read aloud, longer chapter books, or excuse me, longer picture books and some chapter books for grades K through three. So take a peek. I hope you enjoyed and we'll see you next time. Bye library friends. Thank you.